Welcome back to another episode of the CSK8 podcast. My name is Jared O'Leary. In this week's episode, I'm interviewing McKay Perkins. McKay is a professional development facilitator at Boot Up, where I work, so we have been co-workers for the last couple of years. So I figured I'd get him on the podcast to kind of share his insights about some of the things that he has learned by doing elementary professional development over the last couple of years. In our discussion, we also talk about considerations for creativity within constraints, as well as some recommendations for how to integrate in a sustainable way in elementary schools, the importance of feedback both in teaching and in professional development, and advice for anybody who's interested in becoming a professional development facilitator, as well as many other topics. As always, you can find these show notes by clicking on the link in the app that you're listening to this on or simply visiting jaredoleary.com where there's nothing for sale or anything like that. And with all that being said, I hope you enjoy this interview with McKay, which will now begin with McKay introducing himself. My name is McKay Perkins, and I used to be a sixth grade teacher. I taught for five years, and then I got a master's degree in instructional technology, instructional design. And I started working with teachers, elementary teachers and kids with coding, elementary students. And then after my master's degree was through, I've been working with Boot Up now for a little over two years, and I've really enjoyed every minute of it. Personally, I am the youngest of seven kids. I have a twin brother, and I've got a wife and one child. Can you tell me the story of how you got into computer science education and PD? As I said, I was a sixth grade teacher, and when I was teaching them, I began to form a belief that when teachers dedicate time and energy to insert education into a child's imagination, rather than asking them to stop daydreaming, it unlocks the teacher's potential and willingness to pursue education. And I really wanted to pursue this thought of inserting education into the things that children are interested in. So to learn how to do it, I applied and was accepted into Brigham Young University's Instructional Psychology and Technology Program with the idea that I was going to spend my time building what I called a secret agent math curriculum. (laughs) While I was teaching the sixth graders, I saw in math that when they were solving story problems, that they were totally not engaged. And I felt that they didn't understand what the math was actually for or why they were working through the algorithms because the story problems didn't engage them. So they weren't really paying that much attention to what they were trying to solve and why they would try to solve it in real life. And I didn't get why. To me, it seems that it's human nature to love stories, but to hate math story problems. It didn't make sense to me. So I was trying to develop an overarching story with episodes that took students through the entire sixth grade math curriculum, teaching them concepts. And so the idea that I was getting into was that I was going to create story problems where the students could take on the role of a secret agent training to be a field agent. And they would have to use math to solve applicable problems the field agents were facing. And I shared this idea with my chairperson, Peter Rich, and I was his research assistant with coding. And so we were meeting with teachers and students. We taught some after school programs to third through sixth grade students. And we worked with elementary school teachers during their PLC meetings, helping them integrate coding. And he said, hey, you can do the project that you're planning on, but I've got a lot of research opportunities around coding that if you want to do a project there for your master's degree. And as I worked more and more with the teachers and students, I began to see like my original plan to create curriculum that was engaging, that allowed students to pursue their own interests. I could achieve all of these things with coding. And I really enjoyed exploring coding myself. And so I decided to jump fully into coding for my master's project, not just for my uh, job while I was a a master's student. And so uh, my project on computational thinking and helping teachers to apply computational thinking and coding to their teaching practices. And then while I was working with him, he was working with Boot Up and help consulting with them as he's still doing today. And he came to me once and said, hey, Boot Up's looking for people who have your almost your exact experience description. And so I applied and two years later, I'm loving what I'm doing. And now I'm teaching coding to elementary school teachers and students across the United States. I really enjoy it. So it's interesting that 
kids felt that the word problems in particular were kind of decontextualized. That was the only thing that I felt math actually contextualized things for me, but I could still see how it would come across as abstract. So it sounds like when you went into your master's in particular, you kind of had this like change of thought in terms of like direction of where you're going. I'm wondering if you can think of something that you believed in when you first started working in education that you no longer believe. So when I first was getting into teaching, I don't know if I fully believe this, but I kind of felt that most of our learning happens in the typical classroom setting. That sitting in a classroom, going through different subjects, listening to a teacher, taking tests, I think it was probably a subconscious thought, but that was where most of our learning happened. And if we, you know, if we wanted to succeed, that we needed to be good at that type of learning. And why I still think that you do have to be a good student and you have, you do a lot of learning in the classroom setting. Since I have found that especially kids do learning when they are skateboarding and when they are talking with their friends and so much of what we learn and what is valuable to learn doesn't only happen in the classroom, but it happens in the everyday hobbies that we have and the activities that we pursue. And I think it was my experience teaching elementary school that taught me that a lot of my learning has been just pursuing things that I liked and that I was engaged in and interested in. Yeah, that definitely resonates with me. I felt similar things. I just kind of subconsciously thought that, oh, where I go to learn is at school. And I wasn't really learning outside of that. But as I began to work in education, then I realized, wow, there's a ton of learning going on outside of school context. Yeah. Well, and it's really nice as a teacher because, you know, you, it really opens up a field where you can play, you know, the, the types of things that you can do with students with education and the things that they are excited about pursuing. Coding has really opened up the tools that students have and that I have as a teacher to share with students to help them express that creativity and learn in fun, interesting ways. What about with teachers? What was something that you thought when you first began working with them that has changed? And like as an example, so I taught the drumline that I at the high school that I graduated from as soon as I graduated high school. So I had like four years of that. And then when I started my student teaching, I went into my first faculty meeting and professional development session and just kind of like completely changed my understanding of teachers because I realized that some of them were just horrible students in the way that they were behaving. Like all the things they told me not to do in class, they were doing in terms of how they were behaving with each other. And so it just like completely changed my perspective and uh, it was just a paradigm shift. Do you have anything similar having worked in professional development now? As I've worked with teachers doing professional development, the attitude I see most is excitement. And if it's not excitement at first, quickly transitions to excitement. And so uh, I learned teaching elementary school, I would say I was a different teacher than most. And I just I say that because some of the ideas I suggested, a lot of my colleagues looked at me and they were kind of like, that sounds like a lot of work and <laughs> good luck with that. And to a point, like a lot of it, I didn't get done. And so there are, there are grand ideas that I didn't do because it was a lot of work. And so they had a point. But what I found was that where I was weak as a teacher, a lot of times they were strong and where maybe they were weak a little bit that I was strong. And so I tried really hard and I continue to try really hard as I work with elementary school teachers to kind of have this, we work together because rather than getting frustrated because we're different, hey, we both have strengths and let's work together. Uh, but yes, I think I was guilty as well of being one of those poor students in the professional development hours that I took as a teacher when, you know, the temptation was to check the email. I, I did try hard though to be respectful and and pay attention and do what I was supposed to be doing. But I agree with what you're saying. And I'm guilty of it too. So like after I finished all of the coursework for my doctorate, I went back into the classroom. And because I was a new hire in the district, I was forced to take the new hire class, which was geared at first year teachers who had never taught a day in their life. And I was like, I one paper away from a doctorate in education, and I'm being taught what a, an objective is 
and what standards are in lesson plans. <laughs> I was not a thrilled student, but fortunately I had a class that I was teaching at a community college that conflicted, so I only had to go to one of those trainings. <laughs> so if, if someone were to walk into your ideal PD session, what would they see here or experience? It would be very little of my voice talking, which is something that I constantly have to work on. You would see groups of teachers collaborating with each other. And so whether that's sitting together and working on one project together, or if it was in groups uh, sharing ideas for how to take these the new tools and the new activities that coding offers and integrating them into their subject matter. I really get excited when I see expressions of excitement and that happens. Uh, that happens a lot where teachers, you do a project with them and or you talk about an idea for how to integrate some project that we did in coding and teachers are just like, oh my goodness, this is so exciting. It's really, really fun for me. Aha moments with how they could connect what they're learning with their curriculum. One of the things that as I'm teaching, I really want teachers to get from me and or just from the the PD is that allowing students to pursue their interest is so much more important. I feel like they will learn exactly what teachers are trying to get them to learn in maybe a different way than they're expecting. And so uh, that's one of the things that I, as I run professional development, that I really try to stress and hope teachers catch the vision of allowing students to pursue the things that they're interested in. Because your experience in coding is building projects that you like and creating things that you didn't think that you could, uh, it becomes really exciting. And just the nature of what they're doing in coding, you don't have to teach a math lesson. They're, they're going to pick up math principles and social studies principles. If you connect, I mean, you can connect it with social studies and they're going to pick up concepts that are overarching in whatever subject area in language arts and with sequence and all of these things, if we just kind of let go of, of a little bit of trying to force coding into an agenda of what we're trying to teach and allow the students to just pursue it, I think a lot of those lessons that we're desperately trying to get students to learn, they will learn. And so even though that's you wouldn't be able to see that in an ideal professional development, teachers if I can see that they understand that, that is really exciting to me. And the last thing I was thinking about is uh, school administrators actively working with teachers to learn how to create the most successful and sustainable program that they can. When the coaches that we work with really understand how to take the baton and to run with the program, and they understand what their teachers need from them, you can tell. And it's it's really exciting to see. Yeah, those are some great points like administrators need to encourage and provide time for teachers to actually implement this thing consistently otherwise if you're developing these concepts practices etc it's going to take forever if you only do like once a quarter in order to learn a literacy and develop skills you have to constantly practice it yep and you know and it's hard for teachers too I, i totally get where they're coming from because i mean one of the things that me being a teacher has helped me see is that all the different directions that teachers are being pulled. So not only do you have to teach, but you have to like, you have to learn how to manage and you have to teach six subjects sometimes. And you have to, you know, or or if you're teaching one subject, you don't get any breaks in between. You're like specialty teachers. The students are cycling through their classroom so quickly that they're like, I haven't even been able to like get a drink of water, let alone eat my lunch just because they're so busy. And so And so like, it's been really good for me to see the kind of the different directions and experience the different directions that teachers are pulled so that when, you know, I come in as a a facilitator saying, hey, everybody needs to teach coding that if they're like, well, we're doing the best we can, but it doesn't look like I personally would say like, oh, I want it to look that way. I, I try to be understanding of those things and see that teachers are really working hard and trying their best. And that kind of will take what we can get. And hopefully those teachers who catch the bug, hopefully there are a lot of them that uh, they will learn how to do it more and, and achieve a lot of the other activities that they're doing through the medium of, of coding and computer science. It's interesting how much a teacher has to do. And like you said, how many directions they're being pulled at once. And what has been fascinating to see pre-COVID, 
a lot of the discourse that I've seen, especially living in a red state, is that, well, teaching's not that hard. You don't really deserve uh, that much money. And besides, you get like multiple months off throughout the year, et cetera, et cetera. It's like that was kind of like a, a prominent discourse, even with the whole Red for Ed in Arizona, where there's like a lot of teachers who are like, hey, we need more support, not just for our salary, but for kids. But what has been interesting with COVID, a lot of the stuff that I've, I'm seeing is a change in discourse in that people are now saying, uh, yeah, this is actually a lot harder than I thought now that I have kids at home. <laughs> yeah. I'm hoping that to kind of go with the, the tattoo of my arm of like Calvin opening his umbrella and playing in the rain, like we can take this negative that is COVID and, and reframe something positive out it in some way when it comes to discourse on education that I hope it kind of is a reset button where we can say, hey, now that you kind of have some more context for understanding what we're talking about, let's actually talk about funding for schools, for kids, for educators, etc. So we'll kind of see how that happens after COVID is uh, finally over. When I was getting my master's degree, one of my professors, Andy Gibbons, he talked about in design kind of praise for having constraints. Mm -hmm. He said, every designer has constraints. You need to figure out what they are and then work with those constraints. And he said, working with constraints helps foster a lot of creativity. And I'm, these constraints that we have have, I think they've brought our attention to a lot of things. You know, one of the things I've been looking at a little bit is the inequity of students who don't have technology, who are, can't learn from home because they don't have the technology. And hopefully this will instigate creative thoughts for how to solve problems that we've known have existed, but maybe not as much as we do now. And hopefully these constraints, so to speak, of COVID will help us to function with more ingenuity and change the way we're doing things creatively. Yeah. And hopefully it'll help us treat each other with more respect, like as a society. Yeah. And speaking of the, the creativity within constraints, that's been something that's been a big part of like arts education is talking about that. And it was like one of the findings in my dissertation for like why chip musicians like to engage with retro consoles and computer hardware to create music was because of the constraints. But what's fascinating is some people will end up, or maybe not fascinating, what's problematic is that people will often end up taking that idea of creating with constraints and take it to an extreme that kind of like makes it boring or turns it into an assignment. So like an example of creativity within constraints is, okay, you need to create a one minute recording or, or piece of music, and you can only use the objects found within your backpack. So you have to record sounds that you can make with that. But then an extreme version would be like, okay, you can only use these four items that are pre-recorded for you. It has to be exactly 20 seconds long, and you need to include a melody, harmony, beat, etc. Like, it takes the, the creativity part, the constraints, and just like kills it and makes it an assignment. I was at a conference once and I was talking to one, it was a computer science conference, and I was talking to one of the attendees who had heard about Boot Up and looked at our curriculum and was like, oh, I'd never use that curriculum as a teacher because it doesn't, it's not integrated into any subject area. And then she started to talk to me about this integration where like it was a worksheet, a coding worksheet to teach the kids to draw a square. And it basically went through a, through a step-by-step -step algorithm for how to draw a square. And I was thinking like, well, doing that activity, that's great for the teacher. Cause it's like, yes, I'm, I'm teaching coding and I'm teaching geometry at the same time. But I can't imagine a student really for a long time enjoying that type of an activity. And and I, I remember I came and talked to you about it and you were like, well, what about the pumpkin carver activity where that's the whole purpose of that activity? It, it puts drawing shapes in context of creating a pumpkin carver where you it draws the different shapes of the eyes and the mouth and the nose. And I was like, oh, yeah. And even beyond our boot up projects, I try to tell teachers, look, the purpose of the boot up curriculum isn't to like be the end all be all like it's to help students get activated to see what things that they can do with coding but we would want them if they have an idea that is similar to one of our projects or that uses the principles that we teach in our projects we would prefer at least i think we would prefer that they would build a project that they were interested in rather than you know having to build the project that the teacher or that we came up with 
Yeah, and what's been interesting is from that conversation, we have kind of emphasized the integration aspect more. So every one of our PDs, okay, let's let's talk about integration, and we do it at least twice per PD. So trying to get teachers to uncover that, like it was just a simple reframing of, okay, instead of just drawing shapes, how about you draw it on a pumpkin background, and now you're carving a pumpkin. So you could be learning how to do squares, cool. You could learn how to make triangle eyes, or maybe circle eyes, or whatever. So it's it's just a more engaging and contextualized way of learning it. My favorite thing to teach was math because in my adult years, I've really seen what you can do with it. And I, but I didn't get that connection when I was a kid. And I have a, a suspicion that if a kid is doing a project and it's in their mind connected to math, a lot of kids, I think, really enjoy it. But I think there's a, a fair population of kids who they won't engage with what they're doing because they think, oh, this is math and I'm bad at math, unfortunately. And, and so by just phrasing it as a, hey, we're drawing shapes as a pumpkin carver, that takes away the association that kids might have. When I was teaching, I feel like a lot of my kids, it, it was like, oh, this is math. I'm not good at it. And they would not even like try sometimes. And it was with lots of different subjects. And so I think by putting it in the context of, hey, we're just drawing shapes to make a pumpkin carver, they wouldn't really realize that the concept that they were learning. Right. And like code.org uses it in the context of like a uh, flower and art and whatnot, like drawing a flower. Yeah. So I'm, I'm curious, having been a recipient of PD, I know it has informed my approach because I learned like what not to do mainly and then some things of what to do. What about for you? How have your experience as a recipient of PD kind of informed your own approach? My goal for PD, and this is based off of my experience in sitting with PD, there, I went, I've gone to a lot of PDs where I've been really inspired by what is shared, but I leave the PD with a lot of new ideas, but no concrete way to start. Like, I don't know. Mm. And it's so it's like this myriad of ideas has been opened up to me and I'm excited about it, but it's like, ah, what next? And like, I don't know. And it's almost overwhelming. So it's like, I don't know where to get started. And so as the days go on, I just kind of forget about it. And so one of the things that I feel like we've tried to do is share that, you know, uh, ideas that inspire, but also our PDs are a, a workshop model. And my goal is that I try to model the PD where I am acting as the elementary teacher and there the teachers are acting as the elementary students. So I I'll tell, often tell my teachers, I'm going to pretend like I'm teaching a kindergarten class. So please don't feel condescended to, but I'm going to talk as if I were talking to kindergartners. And it's just so that you can see how a teacher could model this in the classroom. And then I address them as if I were addressing kindergarten teachers. And the goal is I'm acting as a teacher so they can see how I'm modeling it and what I am doing, what I'm not doing. And then they can also experience the student side of things. Mm -hmm. And so they're actually building the projects, learning how to code at a student level, which is great for uh, building empathy in them for what their students are going to have to go through in order to learn this. Because a lot of times the teachers are just as new as their students are to the uh, activities that we're doing. And so my goal is that, and I think our goal is that when we're done with the one PD session, K through two students will have three projects that they like or would be pretty confident being able to implement the very next day. And three through eight teachers would have three lessons that they could feel pretty confident implementing the very next day. And so not only inspiring, I guess this is my answer boiled down, not only sharing inspirational thoughts and activities and ideas, but then also giving a very focused way to do it and to uh, accomplish it. So people leave the PD saying, I could do this tomorrow if I wanted to. Yeah, and I'm definitely guilty of having done conference sessions where I'm more about sharing potential ideas and not showing how to do it. Because like having presented at conferences where it's people from all over the place, it's like, I don't know what your individual context is, but I'm willing to chat with you one-on-one. -on -one. But yeah, I totally understand that. Yeah, well, and I think there's definitely a place for that. You also don't want to constrain teachers to, you know, your way of thinking. And so I think having those sessions too, where you are just sharing ideas is important. But I think largely the demographic of 
elementary teacher, you know, it's kind of a, a practitioner mindset. I'm guilty of that too. My earliest PDs, I did a lot of just sharing a lot of ideas around coding. Like you could go to this place and you could try this thing and you could do this unplugged activity and there's this robotic and code.org and scratch. And, and I think it shared like, you know, so many ideas that the teachers were like, I don't even know where to get started. But I think there's also a way to sift through that for the teachers who are beginners in coding. And you you can say like, okay, there's all these activities, but I know teachers are going to want to get started someplace. So let me sift through these things and kind of narrow it in, but still try to teach it in a way that gives the teachers a lot of choice and lets them make their own decisions. So you were talking earlier about integration. Some of the districts that we've worked with have asked us, hey, would you create an integrated curriculum for our teachers? And we've kind of pushed back a little bit on that saying, what we'll do is we'll share ideas for effective integration because the teachers know what they teach best and they know their students best. And we think it's more important that the teachers gain the skill of taking coding and learning how to integrate it into other subjects that they're teaching rather than us just giving it to them. And so allowing that creativity while we're helping them focus, I think is really important in the PD session. So how has, knowing that you have a background in instructional design, how has that kind of informed your own practices or pedagogies? I sometimes feel that professionals are anxious to ask for specific feedback from the people who they're teaching. I think we or they are afraid that if we ask, how is this working for you? That what we're really saying is, I'm not sure if what I designed was good, so I'm asking you to let me know. And I don't necessarily agree that that's the point. I think sometimes we believe asking that question will instill skepticism in the learner about our abilities as designers or our abilities as teachers and trainers. My experience in studying instructional design has taught me again and again that using multiple methods to obtain feedback to try to more fully understand the learner and their needs and desires is a vital part of our role as designers and teachers. Mm -hmm. And I think there's a way to confidently do this where, you know, people know that you know what you're doing and what you're talking about, but we, we need to know people. We need to, we need to see how teachers teach. I think it, it goes beyond just asking them questions and asking them for feedback, you know, and how is this working for you? But actually going in the classroom and observing so you can see how teachers are interacting. I've been reading a book by David and Tom Kelly called Creative Confidence, and they talk about an idea called human-centered design. And I know there's all sorts of perspectives on design, but one of the things that they are really big on is that you need to spend time, whatever you're designing, you need to spend time observing the people. If you're des- if you're designing a product, you need to see how people are interacting with that product. If you're designing a curriculum, you need to see how people are interacting with that curriculum. And so uh, one of the benefits that I've had is that I've been a teacher, which has been invaluable. And so I try to like remember, like I was saying earlier, those experiences of teaching and the and the successes and the challenges and the things that got me excited as a teacher. And I try to pay attention to that as I'm teaching. And I try to, when I go into classrooms and observe teachers teaching, I try to use all of these experiences to inform my teaching. And actually, we have, over the course of our PD offerings, based off of feedback that we get every single PD session, I think we have more than a thousand feedback responses that we've gotten from our PDs. And we've drastically changed some of the things that we do based on that feedback that we've gotten. And so I think one of the things that instructional design has really helped me to focus on in my work is the value of receiving feedback and that we can ask for it without the fear of worrying that people are going to think, oh, they're not, they don't know what they're doing. They're asking us to give them feedback. (laughs) Yeah. And what's nice is like that process, we just like continually iterate on what we're doing every single week, but emphasizing that in PD itself, it aligns with standards. I mean, if teachers can model that as, Hey, like everything that we're working on is iterative, we can always improve things. So how can I better help you? Like it's, it's just generally a good idea. Like as an example, on Mondays, I would have kids set goals for the week. Like 
I'm going to add four more levels and work on the physics of this platformer game that I'm working on or whatever. But one of the questions that I asked that was optional was directed at me and it was how could I better assist you with what you're working on? And so like it kind of provided a way for kids to provide feedback to myself like, hey, I really wish you would help me with A, B, or C. So you can integrate this into what you're doing in the classroom by doing simple stuff like that. Yeah. And when I was going to BYU, I, I sang in the men's chorus there and there was the conductor and she always had an assistant conductor and she sent him up. He was a voice teacher. And she said, Hey, I'm going to have him walking by listening to each of you. He's going to give all of you some feedback. And so if he tells you to do something, don't be offended. Don't feel like, you know, you're doing something poorly. It's just, he's giving all of us feedback and it's an opportunity to receive free advice. And so Uh, I think a lot of times when we're professionals, we don't want feedback because we're like, I know what I'm doing. And if you give me feedback, you're telling me I'm not doing it well. But I think if we take more of an approach, what I'm doing for some people may not be working. And we kind of always have that approach. And we always have the approach, I can figure, if I can figure that out, I can do better. I think it takes away some of our, you know, being offended by the fact that someone gives us feedback on the way we're doing things. And it just is like, it changes our attitude from one of fear and like, I don't want to receive this feedback to one of, I'm expecting to receive this feedback. And the only thing that this feedback is going to do is make me even better at what I'm doing than I already am. And I think if we can feel comfortable, both teachers and students and designers and PD facilitators, uh, I think if we can have that attitude from the very get-go, will be less reticent to receive feedback. Yeah. And I think that even can happen in all forms of relationships too. Okay. So that it's great to be able to receive feedback and whatnot, but kind of going back to what you're talking about with some actionable thing, what about some classroom teachers who are interested in getting started in professional development? Like they've never done it before. They don't know where to start. They're not even ready for feedback yet because they want to learn how to do this. Like, what advice would you give? Like, if you were to hypothetically just, like, lose your memory and didn't know how to design and facilitate PD session, what would you personally do or what kind of advice would you give to learn how to do professional development really well? Let me answer your question with both the idea of learning how to do coding well and learning how to do professional development well as I see it. If I were to lose my memory and have to relearn how to do coding, It's going to sound like I'm being a salesman, but I would start in the boot up curriculum. When I was a master student, when I very first started learning Scratch, and I just played in it, and I learned a lot just by tinkering, but there was certain things that I did that were, there were better ways of doing. And if I had just little prompts here and there, I think my learning would have gone more quickly. Furthermore, working with teachers, there was uh, one specific teacher that I, during the first PD, she was really kind of hesitant and and reticent about coding and her ability and doing it. And she sent me an email and was like, what can I do to improve and get better around this? And I said, honestly, I would spend 10 minutes a day working on a project and go through the boot up curriculum scaffolded, go through it. So again, at the risk of sounding like I'm being a salesman, I'm honestly a terrible salesman, (laughs) but the But that's what I would do. Just spend time doing it. And even if you're like, I don't even know how to do it, don't let those overwhelming feelings that you put it off over and over and over and over again. Just jump in and start playing. I think our curriculum is designed specifically for people who want to create things. But there are like other curriculums like code.org, which is great for people who just want to solve puzzles and things like that through code. Yeah. What about your response to learning professional development? A lot of times... When I go to a conference, I'll read the title of a conference and I'm like, whoa, that sounds so cool. I'm so excited to go to that and learn what it is. And I just, for whatever reason, I sometimes can't put my finger on it. I just sit through and I'm like, man, that that could have been so much more. It wasn't. So I think sitting through professional development or sitting through learning and paying close attention to what am I struggling with? Like, do I like this learning session that I'm doing? Is it keeping me engaged? Am I tempted to check my email? Or I think being introspective about how you 
would learn and what would be frustrating to you in a PD session, I think is a pretty safe bet that it would be frustrating to other people. So before you start creating a professional development, writing down the things that would drive you nuts or have driven you nuts about professional development that you sat through and not doing those things. Additionally, I am like a proponent now after doing what I've been doing. And I I know that this is, again, just for the type of PD that I'm doing. And there's many different types, but I love the workshop model where it gives me the time to jump in and start doing stuff. And the person who's running the professional development is circulating and answering questions here and there, but it's not the full-time a lecture. That to me is really engaging. Yeah, I definitely prefer those approaches more. So McKay has mentioned workshop model, like our approach is like, it's, there's six hour PDs and there's like eight of them spread out over a couple of years. So like usually a month or two in between each PD. So you have like time to implement it. But then when it comes to like PD from a conference presentation session, it's, just, it's very different. Like you just don't have enough time to really dive deep into things. Those are also beneficial to do when you're first starting out because you get feedback and you're only having to do maybe as short as like a five minute session or as long as like an hour or even three hour session as opposed to six. So it's it's good to go in and, and get feedback. But I will say that you will get quite the spread of feedback from people and having like done presentations where I'm like, yeah, I was on my A game or wow, I was like about to pass out from a sinus infection and learned a lot from that session because it didn't go as well as I wanted. Even on the really great sessions, you'll get like, this was amazing. I loved it so much. You really helped me out. And then others would be like, this was horrible. You didn't talk about the thing that you actually did talk about for an hour. So just be prepared to get a range of opinions and perspectives. Oh, yeah. And talking about not being on your A game, here's looking at you virtual webinar. (laughs) 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 <laughs> <laughs> hey, we learned from it. But one of the things that, you know, I was thinking as you were talking is, you know, if I were training to be a professional development person, it, I think it'd be cool to have a notepad or in your phone every time you go to a presentation or a conference or even watch a TED talk. If you come out of it being like, meh, write down the reasons why you are met. Or if you come out of it being like, wow, that was so inspirational. Think about it and name like, oh, why do I feel the way I feel? And I've heard people talk about doing this uh, even in like while you're watching a movie, like if you're watching Rocky Four and you come out of it wanting to be a boxer and you're so inspired, <laughs> write down well, what is it in me that that's triggering? Being cognizant of how we learn all of the different ways in which we learn and kind of making mental or actual physical note of the things that inspire us and change us and that we don't like, I think can really start to build a really good map how we could be good teachers, professional development facilitators, leaders. I think that would be a good practice. Yeah, I highly recommend that. It was something that I also did. So like I would go to like a drumline rehearsal or go to a presentation or whatever. And I would like just sit there and take notes of everything that was done and like how much time was spent on this or would they talk about here and what else did they not talk about? And then I would reflect on it afterwards. Like if I were to design my own version of this, how would I change it? And I certainly learned a lot from it. I'm curious, what are what's something that you do in a PD session that you believe is important to model, but attendees might not be aware that you're doing it? So as an example, when I work with a group of people, whether it's kids or adults or whatever, I'm constantly monitoring like emotional states and attentional states, and I modify and adjust based off of factors like that. But what about for you? A lot of them are activities that teachers do and that teachers are trained to do. So some of them are like, uh, rather than just giving the answer to a question because I'm excited about teaching to allow the learning to happen to students. So a lot of times in PD sessions, a teacher will ask me a question and I don't give them the answer, but I'll try to ask them questions to help guide them to it. Or I will think out loud Uh, my thought processes so they can learn. But And eventually, to be honest, in our PD, we do name those things, but it's later on in the practice after we've already done that activity. So some of them, some things are like giving assessments. A lot of times I just go look at their project and say, hey, can you share your project with? And they don't recognize that I am looking to see if it's functioning the way it should function or if I should give additional teaching based off of 
what I'm seeing. Also doing all that I can to create an inclusive environment by valuing the unique perspectives of each individual. We talk about fostering an inclusive culture in our classroom as with us as the teacher, but it's it's very similar as a PD facilitator to foster an inclusive culture with the participants in the PD. Right. And so to make sure that if there are any, you know, frustrations that people have against certain teachers or, you know, I, I've sat in multiple teacher sessions where there's complaints about this teacher sharing too much or, th- or that teacher asking too many questions. And I think there are constructive ways to address those types of things. But even as a PD facilitator, it's vitally important to, to foster an inclusive culture and to kind of create a community feel saying, hey, look, everybody is a unique person, no matter who they are. And everybody has unique perspectives that if we are willing to listen to them and we are willing to put sometimes our judgment and frustration on the shelf, that we can have a richer classroom experience and community feel because we are valuing the ideas of other people, even if their ideas differ from our ideas and our values, we can still listen to them and learn from them. And so while I'm running a PD I try to be enthusiastic about all ideas that people share and let everybody know that their unique perspectives are valued. And there are things you need to do to make that obvious, but I think there are things that you can do where that's not as obvious. It's something that you're doing behind the scenes. Yeah, that makes sense to me. My favorite learning experiences have been speaking with somebody who had a differing opinion and just kind of like learning a new perspective and it kind of like reframing my own. So yeah, I totally get that. Yeah. So I was listening to an interview with Tim Ferriss and he was asking somebody like, what are your scales? So like musical scales, like the thing that you practice to get better, that is not necessarily like the most enjoyable thing, but it's like something that you just do in order to improve upon yourself. So as a PD facilitator, how do you practice or iterate on your own abilities? The good thing for me is I get to teach the same set of PD sessions to different people over and over and over and over and over again. And it's interesting, even having done this multiple times teaching each lesson, I feel like I learn something new when I when I teach it each time. And and part of that has to do with the fact that there's different demographics of people that I'm teaching it to. I've taught the same lesson to a group of two people as well as a group to 56 people. Even though the content is the same, the learning is very different. So doing it over and over and over and over and over again, I kind of have that repetition, that iterative uh, where I can get practice over and over and over again. It's kind of built into what I do. But I think another valuable portion is the multiple nodes of feedback that I get. So there's another facilitator that I work with and we record our sessions and then we share those sessions with with each other. And also we share them with Jared and other people watch what we're doing and share that feedback with us. And then we get feedback from the teachers for how they feel the professional development went. And then the instructional coaches that that are the district administrator that's supposed to carry on, we're, we're passing the baton to them to make the program sustainable. We get feedback from them and doing this in multiple different districts Even the cultures in the different states that I fly to, people have different perspectives and different things that they want to stress and different things that worry them about, you know, PD. And so uh, being reflective and receiving that feedback and doing it just over and over and over and over again has really helped me to hone my skills. And so I think that's kind of my thought on that. So given the demands and pressures of working as a PD facilitator, you're kind of traveling across the country, or at least were pre-COVID, but now there's the COVID stresses. How do you take care of yourself and like stave off burnout involved with providing PD or just in being in education in general? I try to personalize my work projects so that they are fun for me to accomplish. And for some reason, I don't know why in the education realm, the word fun is almost like the F word. (laughs) 
Yeah. <laughs> Avoid it. I have never understood that. Like I said, if I could at the beginning, if there's a way for me, especially with kids who like are masters or PhDs in fun, if I can figure out a way to not tell them, hey, stop daydreaming and say, how can I take this learning and make it fun and insert it in the things that they're already wanting to do? I think that's awesome. And so I try to do that with myself. I was down in Garfield School District in Utah and the students were working on the animated card and the teacher was saying like, they're making animations, but there's no rhyme or reason for why their characters are moving. Can you help them with that? So I taught a little lesson that did try to do both things, give rhyme or reason to why they're animating the card instead of just having characters move for whatever reason. But the way I did that was said, hey, look, I want to take this animated card and apply it to what I'm interested in. So I wrote down a list of the things that I'm interested in, which of course included Star Wars. <laughs> and then I came up with an idea for an animated card that was a birthday card involving Star Wars characters. And as I was sharing this idea that it was for the students, but as I was thinking about it, I was like, this sounds actually really fun. And so I've been building that project myself and taking the animated card lesson that's the boot up lesson and making it my own. And that has really helped me de-stress as just having fun with the things that I'm doing. Another thing that I do is because I'm traveling a lot, I sometimes work long hours late into the evening while I'm traveling so that when I come home, I've got time to be with my family. Yep. And so a little bit of that balancing of work life and home life helps me to de-stress a little bit and take care of myself and make sure I don't burn out. Yeah, that makes sense. I mean, it's it's like batching. It's making it so that, okay, I know I'm going to be gone. I'm going to be away from family. How about I get as much done as I can now so that way when I return to family, I can just focus on that again. Yeah, and it's been nice working with Buddha because I can have that flexibility. Yeah, for context, we all kind of work remotely and we kind of are able to set our own hours and days and whatnot to just as long as we get our stuff done. Cool. And going back to what you're saying about fun, I had a professor once who asked a question like, why don't we assess whether kids had fun in what we were doing? And what does that say if we are not assessing that? Yeah. And I think where some of the negative emotions around fun come is different definitions of what fun is. You know, it's a lot of teachers like, it's not my job to make it that you have fun. But again, that Andy Gibbons was my instructional design professor. And, and I talked about this with him and he was like, why wouldn't you? Why wouldn't you make, I mean, we can say engaging, but I feel like engaging and fun, you know, are the same thing. When I have something that I want to learn, the process of researching and learning it is just fun. That's kind of my mantra, and I'm sure people can disagree with good arguments, but <laughs> part of my goal is to teach effectively by allowing students to have fun. Right now with being late April 2020, with the stuff going on with COVID-19, I'm, I'm curious, knowing your background and your understanding of like online learning, do you have any off the cuff recommendations or tips for educators who might still be doing online learning at the time that this podcast release? Practice, go through with someone and actually like go through the entire session before you go live. There's a lot of similarities between virtual learning, but there's a lot of things that you're managing that can go wrong. Just as an example, I was doing a, a teacher training for how to teach teachers how to teach virtually. And I didn't realize that in the webinar, there was a tool that I needed to use in a regular meeting session that wasn't available in a webinar type session. And it was kind of my whole virtual presentation relied on that. And I, I didn't practice it in that area. And so I did practice it. But if I would have practiced it with the exact tools that I was going to be using, I would have learned a lot of things before I had to learn them live. And so that would be my suggestion is one, get started, just try it. And if it doesn't work, be patient with yourself and don't get you know overly critical of yourself. And two, practice it with someone to see if you can figure out all of the difficult things before you're live. So what do you wish there is more research on that can inform your own practices? 
there is research on this, but how to successfully instigate and guide people through positive systemic change. And I'm talking about systemic change, like, you know, institutions, school systems that have just functioned the way they functioned for years and years, trying to be the seed that helps change practices that might be good to change. So like a lot of the the things that we teach to teachers is project-based learning and reforming their classrooms around coding, at least to be uh, pursued through project-based learning and a different way of looking at assessments and a different way. We talk about rhizomatic learning, which is the idea that students choose the path of their learning and that it's not necessarily a mandated sequence. When there's you know a system that teaches a certain way, it's hard for anybody to change that. And then it's even harder to change it at a district level or a national school level. And so figuring out how to do that in, in my capacity, the, I'd be interested in learning more about that, how to make it stick and maybe start s- small with the little group that I have, but maybe, you know, getting them to consistently to change some of these ways of teaching that will produce more satisfying, exciting results. Yeah, that makes me think of the interview with Andreas Stefik. I don't know if you listened to that one yet, but it's fascinating. He talked about how language, like a programming language, how there's not a lot of research on the effectiveness of them. And that when he kind of like randomized, like assigned just random characters to different functions that are typically used within programming, like a for loop or uh, if else statements, like some languages performed worse than a made up language that was completely random characters. Oh, wow. So it like shows, oh, we should probably actually research the languages that we're teaching. Yeah. Another thing this, I guess this will be, you know, coming down the pipes, but I'm really interested in seeing the schools that we've partnered with kindergartners that are receiving training in coding. Now I'm really excited to see when those kindergartners are 12th graders and they're taking AP exams a lot of the the diversity issues that we're talking about, the equity issues. I'm really interested to see if the playing field is leveled a little bit. And if we start seeing more different demographics than this, the typical computer science and coding demographic. And is the the field of computer science, which is struggling to find applicants for fulfilling these jobs, will that change due to the work that we're doing? I'll just have to wait for that, I guess. Yeah, and for context for people who are listening, we only work with districts who are interested in doing district-wide implementation. So every kid in the school and in all of the schools are supposed to learn how to code and engage in computer science. So we don't work with districts that are like, well, we only want the gifted, talented kids to do this, or we only want an after school or whatever. What's something that I personally could do with this podcast like as a whole to better assist the CS education community? If you could share with your listeners that whoever they are, they can do this. I think that would be really beneficial. And and I don't know exactly how to do that because, you know, there's a ton of different people and how they think and feel. But I think that's even more reason that this podcast could be beneficial in, in saying that because of who you are and the way you think, We need you to share that. And the more people who participate in computer science in elementary school, the broader and the more diversified this activity becomes. And so figuring out a way to reach the people who are like, yeah, this maybe isn't for me. I think that would be really beneficial. So I hope that as people continue to listen to different interviews and realize that a lot of the guests don't have degrees in computer science, all my degrees are in music education, and I took a class in high school and a a class in graduate school that was related to coding. Like, I hope they understand that, like, oh, yeah, I too can do this thing. Yeah, I'm in the same boat. All my degrees are in education, and I took a class in coding, but it was a very basic class. And I did a lot of research using Scratch and teaching elementary school teachers, but I don't have formal education in computer science, or at least very much of it. And where might people go to connect with you and the organizations you work with? My contact information is on boot up, but my Twitter handle is at Coding McKay, M-C-K-A-Y. Please reach out with any questions or comments. I'd love to talk with you.
And with that, that concludes this week's episode of the CSK8 podcast. I really hope you enjoyed this interview with McKay. He has been a wonderful co-worker to get to know over the last couple of years, and he has a lot of awesome insight on professional development. If you enjoyed anything about this episode in particular, all I ask is that you simply share it with somebody else. That's it. So if you can think of somebody who maybe is interested in doing professional development or who wants to learn more about how to do computer science or coding related professional development, just have them check this out. Maybe they'll get something useful out of it. Thank you so much for listening to this week's episode. I hope you stay tuned next week for another Unpacking Scholarship episode where I'll unpack some of the latest CS education research and the following week, which will be another interview. I hope you're all staying safe and having a wonderful week.